Uh, we've got two wonderful experts here um, from Just Tech and Her Justice to talk to you about phishing. This is extremely relevant and extremely important. I'm going to be turning it over at this point um, to Michael Green to get us started. I'm very happy about this particular topic and, and excited to see it. If you've got any questions as the presentation goes on, please feel free to ask them. There's two ways to do that. Number one, you can type them in the question box and myself and Kat will be monitoring that box um, and we will read those aloud. You can also use the raise hand function, which is gonna allow you uh, us to unmute you. We will watch that and you can ask questions verbally. Um, if anything comes up, please feel free to message us or even contact us afterwards. We're happy to do further follow-up on any of these topics. Uh, take it away for us, Michael. All right, thanks a lot, sir. I uh, um, appreciate the opportunity to, to come in here and do a webinar like this. As, as he was saying, this is really relevant stuff and it's not gonna get any easier. And uh, as IT professionals and, and training uh, staff is, a really uh, important topic. I um, have a lot of experience, 18 years myself in the IT field. The uh, majority of that has been on the nonprofit side. And um, with the legal services, I've worked in the last couple of years, especially, and then with Just Tech now as one of their consultants and engineers. So um, I don't pretend to know everything, but I definitely have seen my fair share of uh, of uh, spam and phishing in particular, and I've seen, um, been in scenarios where we've had to do recoveries and I've been in scenarios where we've had uh, little impact at all because we've been uh, prepared. So um, uh, Mary, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself as well? Sure, I have been around technology for <laughs> years and I am not Going to, not going to go that far back into uh, how close to the invention of fire it was. I have been with Her Justice since 2009. I was made Director of Information Services, first manager, then Director of Information Services in 2012. Uh, we are a legal services organization in New York City that helps low-income New York City women in civil law. And we are partially moved to the cloud and that means that you know we really pay a lot of attention to what's coming in through email and we've uh, come through a couple of attacks ourselves of crypto locker and because we had really good backups it was a lot less painful than it could have been so I'm really interested in this all right um, let's move on to the next slide yep. or two there we go that was us there we go <laughs> <laughs> All the illustrations for this are Mike. He's absolutely brilliant on this. <laughs> Thanks. All right. So um, I think we're all, you know, if if we're here in this webinar, we've kind of heard of phishing before, but just uh, as a our, our basics or so our basics are covered, we, we just wanted to kind of lay down a, a definition of, of what we're we're calling phishing. And uh, um, I don't know if I, you know, it's basically trying to trick staff and users to, to click or open something uh, on impulse, uh, just be, you know, maybe it's a limited offer or a scare tactic. Uh, and and we, we're really just looking at trying to uh, minimize impact uh, to our staff and, and what phishing has done. We've, we've seen it you know, affect huge corporations um, who haven't been as prepared. So this is really just a, a little bit of a, a description and a little good image uh, imagery of, of what we're looking at here. And uh, all right, let's move on to the next slide. All right, so uh, what, the end game for for all phishing attacks is, is money, and in, um, whether it's lost money or for on us or gained money for them, it's really all about uh, our, our piggy bank. So, uh, the the common methods to do something like this are, are compromising our, our our key users, typically in finance or the administration. Uh, they're the ones that would normally hold the keys to uh, any kind of money. Um, also, they try to uh, attack uh, 
uh, IT and human resources are, are big targets as well because um, if they can uh, spoof uh, a human resources or an IT person's account and make you think it's coming from them, you're more likely to click on it. Uh, also like executive administration as well. Um, and the other way is they basically hold the, like crypto locker. They will hold your systems at ransom if they can get in and then either force you to pay a ransom, which is never ever recommended. Uh, there's no guarantee you'll get your data back even if you do pay them. Um, but they, they try to hold you hostage uh, uh, for your data and uh, um, we'll go into later on, you know, how to mitigate and avoid that those kind of pitfalls. Um, let's go on to the next one. Oops, knew that was going to happen. Here we go. Okay, so the first question is, so what? So what happens when someone clicks and enters some information? What, is, what does it really matter? Well, what really matters is that once account information is exposed, you have content management systems, you have client databases, and you have client information that can get out there. And if you're in a sensitive service organization, that can be very damaging to your clients. You also have disclosure and protection rules. If you're in healthcare, that you have a HIPAA violation, potentially. Um, internal files include HR. Uh, getting to your staff ID and getting staff ID, staff addresses, and staff personal information. If, again, if you're a high-risk organization, that can be bad for your own people. What kind of damage can you get from a reputation hit? If something comes out that is from a hacked account that makes your reputation suffer, so something that is racist or otherwise offensive comes out from your organization's account. That's very, that is very hard to come back. And since we know that nothing really dies on the internet, I can go on forever. Recovery costs. Yeah, it, on that, mm -hmm. Mary, I just, if I can interject, I, I just wanted to talk about, you know, we've seen, you know, instances where Twitter accounts, Facebook accounts uh, have been compromised. And, and um, although ultimately, you know, someone can say, you know, I got hacked, but then there's always the, uh, the repercussion, okay, they're, they're, they're not keeping track of their passwords. They're not keeping them secure. So it can really uh, affect how people view your company, whether it's, uh, um, you know, the latest and greatest and they're capable people who can handle my, my case or account uh, to um, on, on the low end, you know, if they can't even handle their, their Twitter account or their Facebook account, how are they supposed to comp, you know, competently handle my, my case or my account? So it's important to keep those uh, passwords, you know, hidden as much as possible and or in the right hands, but also being able to lock them down if someone should leave and disgruntled, something to that effect. So we can mi minimize any kind of damage to a reputation. That's a really important point about critical passwords should not just be in one person's hand, particularly when staff leaves. And that's a recovery cost and it's downtime. If any of these sort of system access things go sideways, what you need to do in order to just track down the user account, track down the password, and be able to shut it off can be really difficult if you're dealing with a vendor system like you know, web hosting um, and trying to convince Twitter or Facebook that you who are you say you are and you represent the company you say you do can be real real saga. Um, so one one note here is that that is not on the slide is 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 ransomware and that is it the pet your ransomware showed up as um, just a, a fake attachment and we're going to be talking later about the damage those attachments can do and and how you can see clues to bad things happening. So. And, and, um, Mm -hmm. I just uh, on the pet, yeah, I, you know, a lot of that, you have to tell you, they've, they've talked about, you know, why it was so widespread and, and what really happened and it, what it really boiled down to is either uh, your, uh, it hit a lot of European and, and uh, companies pretty hard. I know Marisk was a big name that went around, um, but it, a lot of it had to do with just either out of date operating systems or unpatched operating systems. So we'll, we'll talk, we'll get more into that later, but that was uh, 
why that one really hit so hard in, in certain companies. So now we're going to talk about the bait. What leads people to click on things and submit this information? Yeah. Bait is attractive to fish because it's tasty. And the bait that fish emails use is interesting. It catches attention. It seems like it's the kind of thing that a user would be getting generally. So, you know, FedEx invoices, client assistance, and urgent emails, these are things that users get a lot, particularly people in finance. They pay invoices, they pay FedEx, they get FedEx uh, routing slips. So it doesn't make any, it, it doesn't, you know, make anybody worried. Is this really different? Nah, I get a 10 of these FedExes a day. Yeah, let me click on this. You know? Another sort of detail in this is this personalized where email seems to come directly from a known coworker or executive. And we had one that looked like it came from our executive director. Who's not going to open an email from the executive director? Right. And the side thing here is that I have seen rep references to whaling as actually email sent to top executives who are more likely to just open up and deal quickly with their email. Um, password reset and fake communications from IT. If, if your organization is larger than you know, having one IT person or two or three IT people that everybody knows to walk down the hall and talk to, this is more likely to succeed, right? It's IT support. Well, I don't know who IT support is. It's a bigger department. Um, people are more likely to fall for this. URL manipulation, what a link looks like in an email is not what the link actually is. And we're going to show some examples of how you can teach users to look at what's in that link without actually clicking on it. And the attachments with malware goes back to you know fake FedEx invoices, something that looks like a PDF that is actually not a PDF, that is actually an executable. So there are these are some of the the general areas that are more likely to attract unfortunate opening and clicking from your users. Mike? You have anything? Uh, that no, that's that's absolutely right. I, I think um, there's really kind of three big categories, and, and I and I and I touched on them earlier. Is it's uh it's either a, you're looking at a scare tactic, do something now or something bad's going to happen. It's a, um a, basically a you've won scenario where hey you have a limited time, click this so you can get your prize or your free trip, something to that effect, or the uh, uh, the camouflage effect where this is a legitimate correspondence um, and you normally get these anyway or from a reputable source it's it's completely safe at that point so those are the kind of like the the three big uh, blanket categories that that phishing really tries to to disguise itself as um, I, I did want to take a, a moment to pause to see if there were any questions or anything to that effect um, and if Anybody does have a question, uh, feel free to, to put it in chat or use the raise hand function um, so we can uh, try to address it. I, I want to make sure we, we stick to our time, but I also want to make it as interactive as, as possible so people can, can, can talk about it. Um, okay. <clears throat> Could you take just a, a second and explain a little bit one of the terms you mentioned earlier, uh, ransomware, what, what that is and um, if, if you've got slides on it in the future that cover it in depth, but there's several people who, who are not familiar with that term. Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, basically a ransomware is, um, say you've already clicked on an email or opened an attachment that has a, a piece of code that uh, allows access into your, your system and your network. What the, the attacker will do is either in, Typically, it's an, an encrypt all of your your hardware, your hard drive data, or your your network data. So, and then keep the password under their own lock and key, and then they they hold your data for ransom. So, you essentially don't have access to any of your files or any of your data without uh, without them giving you the key. And usually, it's a, a sum of money. But even if you pay them, there's no guarantee. Uh, uh, and then the, 
the way that we look to try to um, avoid that is is having uh, current good backups. And I, I don't want to stress that enough. And we'll talk about more of that uh, in, down the down the line. But that's just kind of like a, a brief nutshell of of what ransomware is. Does that seem to um, does that have, has that helped part? Oh, definitely. Um, and I've also uh, posted in the chat, one of our more popular articles from this last year is over ransomware and it emphasizes exactly what you're talking about, especially with the pre things that you can do. The, the backups um, help significantly. All right. All right, let's so, uh, go ahead. Sure, we're gonna talk about uh, how you recognize this before the great oh no second, which is the time frame between having clicked on something and realizing you shouldn't have, right? So what can you see on your screen? The first thing is that the email tone itself is, is urgent. It is telling you have to do this now. Um, this is popular for on emails that seem to come from the IRS. Right? You must give us money now. Someone's gonna show up at your door to arrest you. Uh, click here now to prevent puppies from being starved, right? That's provoking. Or an email that pre pretends to be authentic in tone. So another a kind of billing thing. You know, in regard to this account number, which is probably not your account number, you know, this invoice has been marked delinquent. It's over 90 days. Please, please click here. So it's that kind of thing. Um, the fishers are trying to get you to do, to take an action, not just open the email. Because opening the email generally doesn't cause, cause something bad to happen immediately. It's taking an action within the email. And that's what you're teaching users not to do, is to open an email, read it, and calm down, take a breath. Okay. The actual sender's email is not who they say they are. So we have an example later on of an email that claims to be from UPS and it's at, it, the email itself is Addison this, that, or the other thing, .net. Yeah. The email address shows, the return address shows up and it's easy to see and it's easy to teach people to see it. Um, if you move the mouse over the hyperlink, the hyperlink text is not what the hyperlink itself is. Uh, <clears throat> that's like, the, in the story of Winnie the Pooh, Winnie the Pooh lives under the name Sanders. If you click Sanders, you're not getting Sanders, you're getting Winnie the Pooh. Here, this is a lot less benevolent. And there are spelling mistakes, there are grammar mistakes, there are things that if you look at, would somebody in an organization really send this out? Really would it be this bad? So it, this is a sniff test. It's teaching people how to develop their own sniff test and how to tell whether something passes or fails. And sender, you know, Jennifer Lawrence is wonderful, but she may not be sending you a personal email. Uh, neither would George Clooney, okay? <laughs> or, um, you know, CIO Mag, well, CIO Magazine is actually really good. You know, I, don't, I haven't seen that spoof too much, but that kind of, you know, okay, Bill Gates is probably not sending you information on how to fix your Windows patch. So that, that kind of thing is what you're looking for. And emphasize to people that mousing over is okay. Clicking is the problem. So, I think uh, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, as far as like claiming to be something, uh, again, uh, well, we have some examples here that will show you a lot of them. One of them being claims to be the IRS. One of them claims to be IT support. Uh, and um, so they, they are what we would normally think of as a reputable source or internal or safe. And that's really the, the, the guise of a phishing email is that it's safe. So here, here's our first example. And the first thing here is that you have a help desk from, that from that's okay. But the csims at addisonparks.org doesn't say that it's a help desk. Uh, you could be forgiven for thinking, oh, it's a person in the help desk department, but that's not what a from looks like. It's usually a real name with a real person. Now, the thing to know about this particular one is that if you were to Google CSMs at AddisonParks.org, you would actually find this is a real person. Um, pretty common last name, and there's nothing too out of the ordinary about the domain. So, 
if you get something that you're not sure about and it seems to be a real person, you can try Googling it. And then does it make any sense? Here it doesn't. Um, so we have a subject that seems to make sense. Um, then we get into the text. And here's where we're talking about misspellings, typos. So that's not how maintenance is spelled. And that's a sentence fragment. And then we have the please view or download your pending messages. So this is urgent, right? It's saying you have these urgent messages. They're, they're not delivered yet. We need you to get to these. And then there's this promise that there's going to be an improvement to your mail system. Who doesn't want a promise to your, who doesn't want an improvement? Yay, yes, let's click here, right? And then we get back to mandatory. And then you have IT support team, which is not the same thing as help desk. So there are a bunch of red flags here. And it's, it doesn't really take long to read them, but you have to kind of know what the clues are. So think about, does this email make sense? Is it what it's, is what it's asking me to do sensible? And all of them have to be right, you know? So the next one uh, is one for, that Mike is going to talk about, these apparently valid email addresses. Yeah, and so all of these are, are real examples that we, we've we've plucked uh, from our, our, our companies. So this is, this is not like something that we fabricated for this uh, webinar. Uh, these are actual phishing emails that we've got. We've kind of, you know, uh, doctored them a little bit so you can see the, what we're looking at here. But um, so this example is one that pretends to be internal. They... Um, actually put our, our, our organization's uh, domain name, uh, which I've redacted because I'm not with them anymore, um, but it was pretending to be someone named Amanda Roberts. Now, me uh, being the one-man IT shop that I was there uh, of, you know, a, a, an organization that was less than 100 people, I knew the names of everybody in the organization. I knew there was no Amanda Roberts in the organization. Um, but then what they did be below that was they used a different naming convention and, and typically and they still had the same uh, uh, domain name underneath. So that was a that's a big red flag to me is, what, you know, we don't have a name, didn't have a naming convention of Amanda at, you know, whatever dot org. And then they changed it to look like it looks like a, a first initial of a first name and the last name of Mendel at the same uh, uh, domain uh, address. So uh, those, if they don't have the same naming convention, that's that should be a red flag right there. And especially if the name is unfamiliar, like I'm not sure this person is, is even here, or maybe it's somebody who's no longer with the company and they're sending an email to the company. That's a big red flag as well. Um, and this one says, you know, we just got this notice from the IRS. We've seen, you know, the IRS emails plenty of times. These are especially prevalent um, from January to April for some reason. I wonder why. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, it's got this IRS notice, you know, 8247, and then ask you, so, so it's asking you the, the um, action item there is, are these correct? You know, check it out. It's from the IRS. It's trying to be important. And then uh, I actually called these numbers at the bottom there, and they just rang busy. I just I thought that was just like, well, let's see what happens if I call them, right? Um, so this is just a, another case where they try to pretend that they're internal. Uh, it wasn't trying to be IT support, but it had something to do with finance. So then it's trying to access money again at this point. Um, let's go on to the next one. Mm -hmm. All right, so this one um, uh, was is uh, went to an attorney, right? And uh, this one's pretending to be at the uh, the from there, the office of the state attorney. Um, and then the red flag here, and I, and I didn't uh, put a circle, I should have, but the uh, it says mail to uh, um, right next to the office of the state attorney. It has a dot department dot outlook dot com, and if it's a if it's a state attorney. I would assume that they're not going to have an Outlook.com email address. They're going to have a .gov, something .gov, right? That's typically the way the, the government would work. Uh, so an Outlook.com for a state attorney is a is a red flag to me uh, that it's it's fake. And these are the kinds of things that we need to teach 
you know, uh, our, the staff is that these are the, the tell signs that this is probably not who they say they are and we should delete it immediately and send out. Uh, uh, usually what I do is when I see something like this, I send out a communication to all staff to say, this is going around. Don't click on it. Don't open it. And if they, uh, I guess the kind of the, the inverse to that is if you already did click on it, please let me know ASAP. <laughs> Because that's uh, happened. Um, actually, it happened in this in this particular phishing emails case. They they sent me this saying that they couldn't open this attachment, and I was like, oh boy. Um, so I know it's it's kind of a little uh, small here. So I, I had this this tan arrow uh, highlighting this complaint eight eight nine four seven dot pdf, and if you mouse over it, and this is kind of what the large version of, it's actually a hyperlink. And so he, the, the user was telling me, I can't open this uh, PDF document. And I'm like, well, that's because it's not a PDF document. And uh, it was, it pro it's a, actually a .zip file, which uh, probably installed some malware. And it has, I, not by any coincidence, the next day we received a spam message to the entire, I, I, I believe they got our uh, entire global address book because they sent a message, an email to everybody claiming it was internal. So there was a little bit of cleanup I had to play on that one because he'd already uh, clicked, this individual already clicked on it. Um, but again, the the the, uh, the bottom red circle, there's a please review the enclosed complaint. So again, there's this urgency. It's a complaint from the state attorney. We need to do something about it now. Uh, again, and then at the bottom, it's, you know, it says the office of the state attorney. But there's no name. There's no contact information to directly, you know, uh, contact anybody other than a, an email address to reply to. So that's a big red flag as well. There's no, nothing to uh, verify it or validate the uh, sender. Um, let's see here. I, let's move on to the next one, If unless anybody has anything else to add to it. Mary? No, I'm good on this. OK. Um, Go ahead. Okay, this UPS, I, I was actually waiting for a UPS delivery when I got this email. And it says UPS Quantum View, which it, I believe is something, is a service that UPS has. But again, as Mike pointed out about the email address, UPS at PierceRx.com. If I had been getting a prescription, I might think Rx, is this some insurance third party shipper that I don't know about? But again, I would I would go and look. I was more concerned because I knew it wasn't a shipment, I knew it wasn't prescription, that the shipment number looked awfully short for UPS. So I went to the UPS website myself rather than following a link, typed in the shipment number and it said this is not a valid number. Oh, well, I kind of didn't think it was, but this is how you check it out. Um, and it said you are, and the email itself actually made sense to me. I have, I do not have a way to get packages at home, so a power parcel going to their office makes sense. Okay. Um, <clears throat> nobody called me. Uh, I didn't get a phone call. I could call UPS, but. I, I don't have a mail mail slip and mail and you uh, my UPS guy does not put anything in my mailbox. And then we get to the to to really the point of the mail, right? It's in health impact now and this um, long link. And no, I'm not going to click on this because at this point it, I know it's not prescription. I, I am suspicious about the rest of the content. Forget it, you know. And then. It had, you know, the shipping service, UPS Air next day, it could be, uh, and that is my email address. But the thing that really clicked it for me was that it was not a valid UPS address. And that's something that anybody can check by going out of the email to their own browser. Uh, Mike? <laughs> Yeah, I just wanted to add, so if, if UPS is sending you like a, a delivery notification, uh, it's going to be not UPS at anything.com it'll be you know like mail to at ups.com uh, or something to that effect uh, where ups will be the 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 domain name and not like the sender name does it make sense um so that's that's where i, I would look at that and say of course it's not right because if it was an actual ups it would be like pierce 
rx at ups.com. So um, that's that's what I, the fishing about that one. All right, let's go on to the next one. Um, sometimes if, if you get an email that seems to be from a large corporation, American Express or UPS, uh, Microsoft, uh, Discover Card, you may want to, if you want to pursue it, these internet headers actually contain all the information about how the email was addressed and how it traveled to you. So in Outlook, if you have the email open, not just, not just previewed, but actually open, File and Properties gives you the internet headers. This is another way of looking at this. It still shows us UPS Quantum View, UPS Pierce RX, and it shows you what kind of mailer it came from and where it's going. If you were, if you were in communication with the actual firm who, who is, is not going to be happy about this either, right, that their email addresses are being spoofed, you can copy everything in internet headers and send it to whichever place their support people tell you. So it's usually like abuse at chase.com or abuse at discover.com, you know, to help them. Is it going to help them a lot? Probably not, but you might feel better. Okay. And again, here, the inter you can see that the original email address had nothing, was not a ups.com email address. Um, so that's, that, so this is Outlook, yeah. And so this is this is from Outlook. I, I don't know if uh, uh, I actually haven't looked it into you know if I was in Gmail myself or or not using something besides Outlook. Basically, how I would get that information. Uh, it might be something that we could look at to see if if there's any questions or how people can get the same kind of information from say like a Google account. Um, I, I looked, but I didn't talk about it. So, anything right, else, so or shall I move on? That's it for now. But so that's kind of like uh, our our case examples. We're going to look at some of the the ways we can uh, prevent and do some prevention, and we we broke it down into two two categories. There's the the prevention that you can do at the the tech level, the mechanisms that we can put in place. Uh, I, as IT uh, uh, on the backgrounds to mitigate, in some cases, you know, omit and and keep the spam down uh, in the first place, uh, or keep us from getting infected or widespread infections. Uh, so that's, that's the technology prevention, um, and that as we talked about initially, you know, the biggest things that we can do. Are, are some of the smallest things and, and uh, keeping your operating system up to date in a current operating system, you know, not don't be using Windows XP because it's not supported and they're not making updates for it. Um, and then keep having a, a reputable antivirus that's uh, that keeps current and updated. And so it's, it's easier to do on a smaller scale. And as corporations and companies become larger, then it becomes the challenge of how do we do this effectively and then verify that it's being done. So that's that right there is, is part of the challenge. And so you, they have these the enterprise solutions, uh, both from like Microsoft for operating systems and then uh, like group policy, or uh, maybe I know Symantec's a big name, but there's also some other names out there that are, are also really good products. But basically to allow you to effectively um, push out updates. And what I mean by push out is, uh, I'm providing the updates to the end user and the end user doesn't have to go out and, and click on something to download something. That's that's the real difference is, is uh, I'm forcing these updates to happen either behind the scenes or, or, or to let them know. And uh, to have that kind of uh, governance in, in uh, as an IT manager or an IT uh, support system, that's the big key right there is being able to manage that on the back end and not in, the users really want to focus on their job and that should be our main goal too is to en enable them to do their job and not have to worry about these IT pieces behind the scenes uh, as much as possible. Um, 
And so that kind of leads into having some of the measures in place and, and some of that's getting the buy-in from administration to, to get these kinds of uh, enterprise pieces of software that are, are scaled to your company that really make the difference uh, from a widespread uh, infection to just maybe one or two uh, computers that are easily cleaned off. It can make all the world a difference to having the right tools for the job. Um, and then outside of that is uh, um, just as important as a recovery plan and reliable backups that are tested regularly. And I, uh, I've had personal experience with uh, a, a ransomware virus that hit a company I was with. And because we had um, verified reliable backups, um, I was able to uh, replace the encrypted uh, um, files in a matter of a few hours, which, uh, and there were, I mean, we're talking about terabytes of data that I was able, that was encrypted. And uh, I was able to uh, basically go from a few hours before that, um, I guess I think I went for the day before. Um, so not much work lost. And that's always the tough part is that if your, your backups aren't current or they're not, not verified, you're really talking about how much time am I losing uh, to go to a, to a backup? Am I going a week? Am I going a month, six months? You really don't want to have to do that when you're going to backups for these, uh, in, you know, crypto locker or ransomware kind of things. You, you need to have current things. So the worst case scenario, I only have to go back to yesterday and that maybe I lose a few hours, but considering the alternative, that's a huge savings on your part. Um, so if, if you don't have anything in place or you're only backing up data, that's half, the, half, that's half the battle, right? So your data is your most important piece, but just as important as your data is your delivery system, your server environment. Make sure those are also backed up, the configurations, because if there's a virus and your, or, or your servers go down, uh, sure your data, your, your data is intact, but if you have no method of access or delivery to the staff, what good does it do you? You're still down. Uh, so uh, it's very important to make sure that your your server environment is is in your uh, I guess there's there's also the internet environment. I don't want to go spin off too much on 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 backups and that, but uh, I do want to say that having those backups tested, verified at a I would say a monthly level is, is my preference, but you know everybody's got their own budget to work with. But just have something that's reliable and in place and a plan. Uh, so you don't have to lose out so much when something does happen. And I say when, because it's, it's really not a matter of if. Um, it, and, and if you think you're not a target, if you've gotten a phishing email, then you're a target. So I, I, I think at this point, there's, there's no uh, if you're a target. It's you are a target. And, and when something like this hits you, it's just a matter of is it widespread or can I and I really just laser focus it and just, you know, clean a PC off with a with a with a quick check. Um, and then cyber insurance. Mary, did you want to talk about that? Uh, cyber insurance is is relatively new and some auditors actually request it and some some audit and finance committees and boards request it. And it obviously it can cover a variety of things. It can cover a ransomware attack. Not to say that it would allow it would be funding for the payment of ransom, which again is really really not recommended, but for costs associated with recovery. And it's a it's a belt and suspenders thing. Um, if you have been hit and your board wants assurance that you have you'll have a capability of spending money to outside budget to recover. This is something you may want to talk about. Certainly, if your auditors bring it up, have the conversation. Just don't say, "Oh, that's not. We're not big enough, or we're not important enough." Do have the conversation. Uh, the other thing I would like to say about uh, you know, Mike is 150% right about not Windows XP, not outdated operating systems, not leaving patches go for months and months. That said, uh, today is Patch Tuesday for Microsoft. It is okay not to update your patches the same day, particularly in a smaller organization. I, and I tend to wait till the Friday because if there's something wrong with a patch, Microsoft, I, I know this may come as a terrible shock to many people, but Microsoft sometimes releases buggy patches. 
And if you are an IT person of one or IT department of one or two, you don't want to be the one discovering that. So patches, yes. In the first 24 hours, maybe not, but certainly in, in a week. Okay. Uh, Mike, shall I go on? So there is a, a quick comment here, um, which is in Gmail, you hit drop down on the right and select show original. And that shows you all those things you were looking at in Microsoft. Um, and pretty much every email client, there is a way to get at that uh, back end information. Great. Right. All right, thanks for that. Um, so uh, just a, a quick tidbit of information. So this was uh, this happened uh, last uh, May when there was a, a, a wanna cry, which is the name of a, a ransomware that happened last May. The uh, uh, National Health Service uh, for Britain uh, did a, a kind of study on, on you know operating systems for computers, just desktop computers, and why why it was so widespread. And so this was just uh, last uh, May 2017, and they found that um, probably you know close to half of the the pulled operating systems were Windows 7, but they weren't all they weren't uh, fully patched. So that was a big factor. And then there was still um, a, uh, the third largest operating system used was still Windows XP. So 7% of, of the computers were still using Windows XP, which isn't gonna be patched uh, for the, for the um, particular vulnerability anyway. So uh, there's a, that's particularly, that's why WannaCry uh, ransomware was, was such a big hit is that they, and apparently they didn't learn because pay you hit only uh, like a month, two months, months later. So uh, it's it's really uh, a challenge for these huge organizations to really get these things at a comprehensive level. But as you can see, it, it has to be done, or you're just you're continually going to get hit um, with these types of attacks. All right, so let's move on to the next type of prevention that we have. Um, Human prevention, there's always the human element, right? So we, we have the technology, the mechanisms that we can put in place on the back end, but the the, the element that we really can't uh, control as far as IT ourselves is, is the human element. So this is really where like the coaching and the training is gonna come into play with staff to really teach them the, the tell signs that we talked about here and then how, how to uh, respond, you know, um, and if they think something is suspicious. And so this is really empowering all the staff and it's not enough for them um, to just uh, call IT, I would say. They really need to know these things because um, if we know after the fact, you know, even if it's five minutes after they've clicked on something, you know, things can spread pretty fast, pretty quickly. So we need to make sure that we minimize the impact as much as possible. So the first thing we've got here is is checking with IT before any action. If you think it's fishy, you know, even if I, I've come across people who said, you know, is this is this you know uh, phishing? Is this fake? And I and I've looked at it. I'm like, no, it, it's not fake. It's legitimate. Uh, that's that represents the. Uh, I guess the the minority of the times that that's happened, usually it is fake, but sometimes it's actually a legitimate email. And uh, I'm actually happy for those users because they took the time to to ask me. And I and I, I've always told people that I'd rather take the five minutes time it takes to check something than have to worry about the fires I have to put out if something you know big happens. It's well worth my time as, as an IT professional to, to the staff. And it also helps build rapport and trust with the staff so they know they can come to me and I'm not gonna say, oh, you're so stupid, why did you do that? That's really not the approach that I take. I, I'm always glad and happy when they approach me with those types of things so I can uh, address it and, and build that confidence. Um, another way is just to ig ignore unsolicited email um, and attachments. You know, I, I don't mind getting the first few uh, emails from you know up from a particular phishing email from the organization but when someone hits the reply all and and, and it keeps on going I got this did you get this and then there's like the, the grapevine chain um, you know they get that goes old real fast at that you know one if I've sent out a communication I would you know 
I think at that point, but that's my take. I don't know. Maybe Mary's got a different take. A lot of stuff to unpack there, but the hands-on training with staff, taking some examples, letting staff look at them, trying to look at side by side two or three different emails and figure out which one of them is a phishing email. That type of practical hands-on cannot be overemphasized. It's very easy to look at these after they're already circled, but going through that discovery process is really the type of training that will work well with staff. Yeah, and that kind of is the, the next point, that continual uh, training and those cheat sheets. And like, like Sarah was saying, the, the, the case examples, showing people is better than just telling them. Uh, and it's better than just, you know, uh, iterating it through like a webinar or, you know, bullet points, you know, taking the time out with staff and showing them so that, that they feel like they can recognize it. Uh, it. That's a really big empowering moment for them, I would say. And and it's critical for the company to to minimize these types of things. Uh, I kind of added this little this little saying, I you know, when in doubt, ask about just because it rhymed. But <laughs> it's really just more of, uh, you know, if you're not sure, uh, it's OK to ask. It's not something we want to, you know, I'm not going to, we shouldn't be making uh, staff feel stupid about bringing these types of things to us. Um, and then we, we should also teach them how to be using their junk mail list, how to, uh, how they can take action as much as possible on their end to either, you know, we, we you know, we hear about when stuff is going to their junk email and it shouldn't be a lot of times, but we should also be teaching them, you know, how to manage and send, you know, ignore and block senders to that effect uh, can reduce a lot of phishing and spam um, on those ends. Anything to add, Mary? Well, I am, <clears throat> one thing that I, I find with my staff is when, I, when they say, oh, I feel stupid asking, I feel, you are not stupid, you wouldn't be stupid if it, you're working here, you're a smart person, you have different information than I do, and we're sharing information to protect the organization. So I always, I talk about this with my staff and my users is teamwork. And, yeah, and it, that builds it's morale. Very important. I agree. I, I work for a, a legal services company and I, I, I would get the comment quite often, you know, I feel stupid for, for asking you this or this is a stupid question. And uh, my, my response is always, you know, you're, it's not a stupid question. You know, you're an attorney or a paralegal or administrator. That's your job uh, is to know the, know those areas. Your job isn't necessarily to be an expert at, at phishing or uh, phishing attacks. That's my job and I'm here to educate. So that's, that's really my take on that is always be supportive and empowering for the staff. And we've, we've got two more comments here. Um, one of them is on um, considering updating to Windows 10 because of the um, stronger controls that they have over updating. That's from Tony White. Um, and it, I mean, he goes beyond that and says that it's a strong reason to update to Windows 10. Um, and then uh, Joanna Otero has a question here. Um, as for uh, junk email stuff, how safe are unsubscribe links? Or can this be a phishing link also? So I, I guess that you really have to look at the email itself. Is it something that you know you've subscribed to, right? Uh, if it's if you don't feel you've subscribed to something and it says, you know, un, you know, click here to unsubscribe, it very well could be like, you know, something disguised as a legitimate, you know, you've subscribed to this, click here to unsubscribe, but then the hyperlink is, is taking you to someplace else. So I'd be extremely skeptical, especially if you aren't like a, a typical subscriber of, of, you know, where it's coming from. Uh, if you are, how safe is, is the unsubscribe? If, if it feels like, you know, I, I get these emails, I don't want them anymore, and I click the unsubscribe list, um, then it should be safe enough to click the list. What they do with the list is is probably based on their own terms of service of, of what they're going to do with it. I, I got to take them for their face value. For if they say you're going to unsubscribe, I would I would assume they're going to unsubscribe. But uh, I I just w w would be skeptical only if it's a, a, a situation where I don't recognize the subscription in the first place. I uh, hope that makes sense. Oh, and to answer the other question about Windows 10, um, it's 
you know, it's it's going to happen. Everybody's going to move there. Whether you know, it seems that it's not like Windows 8 where Microsoft kind of jumped off of that shit pretty quickly. Uh, but Windows 10 seems to be sticking around. So it's kind of a matter of uh, not if, but when. When are we going to do it? I think it's been around long enough, and people are and more and more agencies are looking to to migrate to Windows 10. It's I'm I'm not gonna lie. If if you've never used it and you're used to Windows Seven, there's there's a little bit of a, a there's quite a bit of shift into how you get to where you need to go. And on the backside, it, it the same components as far as administrators go anyway are are still there. Um, but how you get to them is is always the, uh, the 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 chase, right? How do I find what I what I know I'm used to looking for, and I don't know it's not there anymore. So I recommend you know finding or you know trainings and tutorials, and it's always good as IT administrators and professionals to go ahead of the game and 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 pilot out some computers and find those answers so you're not, you're prepared when you're going through an implementation and uh, and don't and don't hurry into something like that it's going to take some time and it's going to take some time for the staff as well because it's a, it's an adjustment yeah william tell reinforces that the uh, unsubscribe links can are, are occasionally a really bad idea so unless you really trust the organization you know you signed up for it um i in Google, I often just report them as spam, and then Google will tell me, oh, wait, there's an unsubscribe, and this is an option, and then Google will unsubscribe for you. Um, but if if I don't want it there, and I don't remember it, and I don't know the org, I'm not clicking on it. Um, right. We've got a question here from Tony White. Um, is there any advice on how to work with Office uh, 365 Exchange spam and content settings? Um, there are defaults, but um, is there experience of setting those at other levels or policies that's helpful? Uh, I think I, I probably have to, uh, I haven't had so much experience with that, but mostly you worked directly with Exchange server itself. Uh, so if I know Office 365, I'm just getting my hands uh, dirty with that, uh, with um, uh, uh, Just Tech. Uh, so I, I don't want to misinform somebody on, you know, where to go and where to look for. I don't know if you have any more insight on that, Mary. Uh, we've been on Office 365 for a couple of years, and I would say at the beginning, <clears throat> uh, we've been using the standard, um, we, we use the standard settings, and I, I think that it tends to just go a little strongly in the other direction where people are finding stuff in junk mail and clutter that they don't really want to be there. Um, clutter is a useful mid-step between junk mail and your actual live inbox. And that, it, it, it's worth installing. Sometimes when you first deploy Office 365 and clutter comes along, people get frustrated. But it is worth a training with users to sit down and talk about what they think of as clutter and what they think of as junk. And, and the, the default uh, system quarantine is pretty good. Uh, you can use the uh, the Office 365 administration tools to cap to catch before you, to catch certain kinds of junk even before it hits the user box, and that's been helpful. Yeah, and, and we've um, had enough questions about 365 that we have put in a short series of 365 specific resources this year. I believe that our next webinar on a 365 resource is in October, uh, but I I do not know the best practices with 365 at this point. Uh, but I'm happy to look into them. Yeah, same here. And that, and that was my next question. Sorry, because I know you mentioned at the beginning there was a, an Office 365 webinar coming up, and I, did, I wasn't sure if that would be one of the topics or, or something that could be touched on for that or not. I will definitely bring it up to the presenters because there's clearly interest in it. Um, there's another question here, which um, is, is there a, a cheat sheet or a um, – because you're mentioning here in this slide – um, to have a cheat sheet for staff, is, do you have one of those you'd be willing to share with the community or something that we can post online uh, along with the takeaways from this? So I don't, I don't, I guess I don't have one like right here in front of me, but it, I could come up with something that would be general. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I, there's, uh, I, again, so like it, this webinar might even, you might, 
you know, if you if you took uh, some of the slides from the from the case examples, you could incorporate those for for a cheat sheet, and that's perfect. I'm I'm perfectly okay with that. Mm -hmm. It's it's really a lot about uh, dissecting you know case examples as far as what I would think is as a cheat sheet and saying you know what's a classic you know you know phishing email and then pointing it out in the little arrows and and uh, numbers to the to the staff so they know and what I, to look for. I think it's helpful to also have it specific to your particular um, email system if you're using Google if you're using 365 if you're using um, 2012 um, screenshots from from what's exactly the email types that they're looking at. The general ideas are helpful, but if you're, this is already a little bit of a scary topic to your staff, if they're not going to be familiar with it, um, it it's going to make it more confusing and the differences in systems will distract from your overall message. And that would and be my exact rec recommendation is to, is to tailor it to your systems uh, email system and, and so people can identify with it more. Particularly if, if you've got a good relationship with you, with users who point these out, because then you you can give a shout out to the user who brought it up, and then it it encourages morale, and people feel like they will be appreciated for passing on these bad emails. So yeah, definitely take the screenshots from your from your own system and, and do two sides of one page with mm -hmm. liberally lit illustrated with arrows and text boxes. Right. Um, well, if we don't have any more, we can move on to the next one, which is... Uh, okay. Oops. One, two, four. There we go. So uh, policies and training. We've done a lot of talk about training already. Uh, I did want to touch on on policies because that's kind of the, the organization's, you know, stance and uh, that, that they're taking towards uh, the the value of of these kinds of things of, of training and in keeping systems updated, uh, but the, the, some of the policies I've, I've also here as examples are, are acceptable use. You know, when when you onboard new people, that they uh, there is a precedent set, so they know what what they can do and where they can go and kind of and be relatively safe um, some of that's also done the back end through through content filtering and, and spam filtering but certainly people have to always be vigilant and, and not you know look to go to sites that might potentially have malware on them um, mobile devices are, are always especially when you're bringing in devices from home uh, is a good policy to have to make sure that uh, things are secure and people aren't bringing in uh, infected devices from the outside. Guest use kind of goes along with that being for uh, uh, in interns and volunteers and people visiting the organization for extended periods. If they're accessing your network, they could be potentially bringing something in from the outside that, uh, you, that you don't, that's gonna, that could be widespread, you don't know. Uh, and then email policies uh, about, um, um, I think it's more of a usage policy, but how you send emails can reflect on the company and uh, if if you're getting emails. And so that's really to, might not be per specifically to phishing, but I, th I think it pertains to it at some level. Um, and then below that kind of jumping back into the training and you know, it's, it kind of says whether they've been there for 20 years or, or, just, or just a new person, I, I would even contend that the new people are more uh, um, receptive to the change because it's not as ingrained to them. If someone's been there for 20, 30 years, they might have a pen and paper process or, or a really old process that they're used to and they and they don't want to go away from. Uh, I, guess, I guess the good thing about pen and paper is that there's no phishing or malware <laughs> with that kind of thing. Uh, um, and then, so we have this, I want I wanted to jump down to this training practice, this phishingbox.com. I did want to tell kind of a, a case story that we used here at, at Just Tech internally, actually, uh, is what phishingbox.com, and I believe it's open source, and, and what it does is let you as an, uh, as an IT manager or administrator set up a mock phishing uh, email. Um, for your staff with zero consequence. And what that does is allow you to see, it, it gets you to, and you, and you probably have a suspicion already if you've been there a while, is who your clickers are, 
who your attachment openers are. And you can use that data then to have, to bring into your trainings to say, you know, and, and I don't know that I would mention names, but you can certainly use percentages, you know, 15% of the company opened up this fake email that I set up and they entered in information like, like login credentials. Uh, the good thing about this phishingbox.com is that it doesn't record any of that, uh, that entered in information. So it's not recording <coughs> usernames and passwords. It, it, but it does do, uh, uh, you can set things up uh, internally. I know we, we went as far as to setting up uh, registering a domain name and we made it look really, you know, similar to a, a legitimate domain name. And, and then we set up, you know, uh, a place for people to put in information like name and, and username and password to maybe it's a, a, a fake, you know, password reset kind of website. And we actually did as an, I, you know, we, we get, we got some hits internally. So it was, um, it's uh, nobody's immune to these types of attacks. Uh, that being said, we had to be really, really good about how we crafted it because to fool people in IT, you have to really be uh, to know what you're doing and how and what people's general tendencies are. Um, hey, Mary, did you have anything to add on that? And no, but one point that uh, Mike made when as we were talking about setting this up is that if if you are going to send out a test, you do have to let the executive director know. And yeah, don't do this on, ad hoc and on the fly. And you don't want to tell a lot of people, but I believe the ex executive director is somebody that you should clue in. Hey, I, I'm, this is what I'm thinking of doing. Is it okay first? <laughs> so that you don't have uh, unhappy people feeling fooled and, and right. the executive director feeling fooled too. Again, yeah, and again, I would leave names. If you're going to use it for training, leave names out and just say, you just kind of you take it to percentages, things like use it as, as a teaching and a coaching method. Um, yeah, I think that's I think that's what we were saying. And then the uh, U.S. Uh, Gov site is uh, the is a federal uh, incident response team tip. It, it, it's useful reading, and I think that uh, would take us into the resources side. Mike, are you ready for that? Yeah, we're okay? short on time, so I want to keep us you know as honest as possible. So uh, on the the next slide there, the the health of resources we have uh, of. Um, Alice and Tap, of course, and Idealware, who are who do lots of trainings to to teach staff uh, and people about, generally speaking, uh, the the issues at hand in Office 365. Uh, I also wanted to mention the the traveling coaches. There is a, a, a particular module uh, in there that uh, um, deals with security awareness. It's a uh, um, so that one is probably my. Uh, my personal favorite of, of the of the modules in there. Uh, I did want to mention that while they're not tailored or particularly, you might have to do some digging. YouTube videos can provide some sort of self help uh, at a minimal level if you don't really have access to anything else. Um, and then uh, the uh, the FBI archives at FBI uh, .gov there talks about identity theft. Uh, did you want to go into that more on Mary? Uh, no, it's a, a historical one on, and it, even though it's 10 years old, it's still valid about uh, what happens when a company gets hacked. It's a, it, it's a useful cautionary tale. Right. Um, so I know we're real short on time. I, the, the next couple of slides, I, if you have any questions or comments or feedback, uh, feel free you know, to contact us. Uh, again, I'm uh, Mike Green with Just Tech and Mary, Mary O'Shaughnessy with, with Her Justice. And uh, we're all about helping the community become stronger and better ultimately. That's really what we want to do. Um, but I do, I do want to say thank you to everybody who, who came out and participated and attended. Uh, I'm really glad that this went as well as it did. And I, I think Sart would agree there. Yeah, very happy with this overall. Um, we, we did have another comment um, from Tony over um, just that 365 is, is very different than on premises and that is something we are going to look at more. Um, if people have any follow-up questions, best practices, that type of stuff, I also recommend them taking it over to the LSNTAP email list 
lsntap.org. On our front page, we've got a link to the email list. It's hosted over on Google Groups. Um, there's about 700 of us that work in this field, and it's a wonderful way to ask questions, to share best practices, that type of stuff. If you come up with a sheet of best practices or a policy that you want to share on uh, use your own devices, that type of stuff, or if you're looking for one, ask that group of people. A lot of people have already put this stuff together and are willing to share it widely with the rest of the community. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you so much, Mary. Great topic. I look forward to doing more stuff on this, uh, on security in particular. Um, this is our third webinar this year that we've focused on security, and it's just so important to us, to our clients, and to the community overall. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.